there's said to be a growing dead zone in Lake Erie. I'm Dr. Dave Ecologic, and I'm going to use Sherlock Holmesian methods to solve the mystery of the Lake Erie dead zone. Let's imagine we're underwater in Lake Erie investigating the dead zone. A couple of fish are swimming by behind me. If there is a dead zone and they swim into it, what would you expect? I'd expect them to die, hence the name dead zone. But is that what really happens? And if so, what causes the dead zone? Lake Erie is known to have botulism. Could botulism be the cause of the dead zone? Botulism is caused by bacteria. It kills fish and birds, typically near shore, in the spring and fall of just some years. Here's a look at a fish kill on the left, and on the right is a dead bird on a beach. Beaches could be littered with dead birds during a botulism outbreak. Going back to the original criteria, botulism kills fish and birds, whereas the dead zone is only associated with dead fish. Botulism typically takes place near shore, whereas the dead zone is out in the deep water of a lake. Botulism takes place in the spring and fall, whereas the dead zone takes place in late summer, and botulism only happens in some years, whereas the dead zone happens every year. Furthermore, botulism is only associated with one kind of bacteria, Clostridium botulinum, which produces toxins when low oxygen, warm temperatures, and other factors combine. Botulism and the dead zone do not have the same traits, so the answer to this question has to be no. Lake Erie is well known to have mercury problems, so could mercury be causing dead zones? Well, mercury comes from natural and man-made sources. It was at high levels in Lake Erie in the 70s and 80s, so much so that the fisheries had to be closed because mercury bioaccumulates. This diagram illustrates that mercury can come from natural sources such as volcanoes or human-caused sources such as coal plants and mines, and it gets into the water. When krill live their entire lives in that water, they accumulate mercury. When fish such as salmon eat krill throughout their lives, the mercury becomes magnified, and it becomes further magnified as it works its way up the food chain so that it's highest at the top of the food chain. Notice the advice for consuming fish across the bottom of this chart. It's okay to eat plenty of fish at the low end of the food chain where mercury is lower, but it's not so safe to eat fish containing high levels of mercury towards the top end of the food chain. Pregnant ladies in particular have to be very careful about how much mercury they consume in their fish. Mercury decreased in the 1990s when we were paying attention to it, but now it's starting to increase again. Although that's a problem, we can't tie it to the dead zone in any way. So the answer to that question is no. Could it just be a matter that so many fish have been taken from Lake Erie that now there are no fish left in certain parts of the lake? Lake Erie has been known as the world's greatest inland fishery. Granted, it has been reduced by pollution, sea lampreys, various invasive species, and overfishing. Here's a conservation officer using a gill net to check and see what fish are in the lake. And it's still a great fishery. 50 million pounds of fish worth $245 million are taken from the lake every year. So no, it's not simply a matter of overfishing. Sea lampreys are known to be in Lake Erie. Could they be causing the dead zones? Sea lampreys have been in Lake Erie since 1921 when the Welland Canal was finished to bring large ships into the upper Great Lakes. The sea lampreys got in there and they parasitized large fish and they decimated the fishery. There's a look at the business end of a sea lamprey, and you can appreciate how they could rasp their way into a fish and suck its bodily juices out. However, sea lampreys are now largely controlled with chemical lampricides, barriers, and traps. So no, sea lampreys are not causing dead zones. Is the dead zone caused by Asian carp? Asian carp is a blanket term used to refer to four species of carp, big head, black, grass, and silver. They have been in the USA since the 1970s when they escaped from fish ponds. They are throughout the Mississippi Basin in high numbers where they outcompete fish and drastically change fish habitat. Here's a private citizen being concerned about Asian carp at a public meeting. And the concern is how to keep them out of the Great Lakes. Well, a few Asian carp have actually made it into the Great Lakes, but they're not firmly established. And so, no, we can't blame the dead zone on Asian carp. 
is the dead zone caused by invasive species that arrived in the ballast water of international ships, such as the zebra mussel. Zebra mussels arrived in the 1980s, they encrust rocks, they block intake pipes, and they change food webs. And in addition to that, they filter lots of plankton. Now that sounds like a good thing, but if they're filtering lots of plankton that contain mercury, then they're concentrating it so that it will move further up the food chain than it would otherwise. There's a good look at some zebra mussels. On the left, you see them encrusting a rock. Imagine what that would do to property values if you had a rocky beach. On the right, you see them encrusting the outside of a pipe. Imagine what would happen if they encrusted the inside of a pipe like that. And that's what they do. And it ruins various kinds of intake and outlet pipes into Lake Erie. Zebra mussels live in relatively shallow water, and the dead zone takes place in deep water. So zebra mussels can't be directly tied to the dead zone. And the answer to that question has to be no. Is the dead zone caused by ballast organisms such as round gobies? Round gobies arrived in the ballast water of ships in the 1990s. They displace native fish, they eat their eggs, and they take over their spawning areas. There's a good look at a round goby. Round gobies also eat zebra mussels, which sounds like a good thing, but the zebra mussels have been concentrating mercury, and if the round gobies eat them, they're just moving it up the food chain more than would normally be the case. However, that's not tied to the dead zone, so the answer to the question has to be no. Lake Erie is known to have phosphates in the water. Could it be phosphates that are causing the dead zone? By the way, I could be using the term phosphates or phosphorus, but the public is more familiar with phosphates, so I'll stick to that term. In the 1960s, phosphates were blamed for turning Lake Erie green. And here's what it looked like back in the day, algae green. How do we know it was phosphates? Well, Dr. David Schindler did some work in experimental lakes north of Lake Superior in which he would take a lake and divide it in two with a seawall. Then he would put a chemical on one side of the seawall that was not on the other side. And this is what happened when he put phosphates on one side, algae green. So phosphates were banned in soaps and detergents, sewage methods were improved, and the situation got better in Lake Erie. However, recently phosphates are increasing again and summers are getting warmer. So we'd better put a pause on that. We'll come back and think about phosphates again in a minute. Is the dead zone caused by oxygen demanding wastes? Environmental scientists like to talk about the value of anything that is nutritious. And by that, they don't mean nutritious to humans. They mean nutritious to bacteria and algae. If it's nutritious to bacteria, then they'll grow like crazy and use up all the oxygen in the water. If it's nutritious to algae, they'll grow and then they'll die and be decomposed by bacteria, which will grow like crazy and use up all the oxygen in the water. Sewage is very nutritious to bacteria and algae. It contains lots of phosphates and nitrogen. It causes bacteria and algae to grow like crazy and ends up depleting oxygen in the water. Here's a quick look at a sewage treatment plant just to remind you what those are. Fertilizer used in farming is nutritious to bacteria and algae. It contains lots of phosphates and nitrogen. It causes bacteria and algae to grow like crazy and ends up depleting oxygen in the water. Lots of farming goes on around Lake Erie. Are dead zones caused by oxygen demanding wastes? Reviewing the facts of the case, we know that anything nutritious to bacteria and algae can use up oxygen in the water. We know that fertilizer and sewage will do that and that they're abundant around Lake Erie. And we know that phosphates and nitrogen are the culprit chemicals and they are abundant in fertilizer and sewage. So the answer to this question is yes. All water-soluble wastes, whether they're chemicals or whatever, from cities, factories, farms, or sewage plants, are going to end up in the lake with me. Look at the size of the Great Lakes Basin, marked in green, on this map. Anything water-soluble that hits the ground in that area is going to end up in the Great Lakes. Anything that starts off in Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, or Lake Huron has to go through Lake Erie. And you might say, well, why isn't Lake Ontario even more full of dead zones? Because it's further along the chain. But it's a deep, cold lake, which is not conducive to bacterial and plant growth the way Lake Erie is. 
because it's a warm, shallow lake, perfect for the formation of dead zones. Let's go back underwater and start to apply our knowledge with a bit more information about lakes. In spring, the fish can swim anywhere they want, so they choose the best habitat and start to live their fishy lives. In summer, Lake Erie, like many northern lakes, stratifies itself into three temperature layers. There's the epilimnion, the warm oxygenated water near the surface. There's the hypolimnion, the cooler water closer to the bottom. And there's the thermocline, a zone of rapid temperature change between the other two layers. Many species of fish prefer the cooler water near the bottom of the lake, and so they confine themselves to the hypolimnion. Lake Erie is full of nutrients, and so a thick layer of algae will form at the surface of the lake and prevent sunlight from going further into the lake. Eventually, the algae dies and sinks to the bottom of the lake. And that is where bacteria will decompose the algae to form an area of very low oxygen, the dead zone. Some fish may die and float to the surface. Some fish may die and sink to the bottom to add to the decomposition there but many fish will simply have to swim away to try to find alternative habitats somewhere else in the cool portion of the lake, or they may even be driven into the warm portion of the lake, which may not be particularly suitable for them. The bottom line is that in late summer, a large dead zone forms in the central basin of Lake Erie that excludes the fish. Are dead zones found strictly in Lake Erie? Well, in 1960, there were known to be 10 dead zones in the world, that number had increased by 2003 to 146, and now there are known to be more than 500 dead zones in the world. The largest dead zones are in the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Baltic Sea. There's a particularly well-studied dead zone in Chesapeake Bay, USA, and the other Great Lakes are now starting to show dead zones. So the answer to that question is a resounding no. Are dead zones a great threat to humans? Well, Lake Erie provides drinking water for more than 11 million people, and that water is safe to consume. It provides more than 50 million pounds of fish annually, and those fish are good to eat. But the fishery and the aquatic ecosystem are threatened by expanding dead zones. If this goes on into the future, there might not be that much of a fishery left. There's also the matter that toxic blooms happen every now and again because of blue-green algae poisoning the water temporarily, and there's still the matter of botulism and mercury in the water. So, in answer to that question, no to the first part, and something more like a yes to the second part. What can we do and what can we expect? Well, there are various Canada-US action plans that have made hundreds of recommendations. I'll bring it down to just a few. We could make better use of fertilizers, using better fertilizers in smaller quantities at appropriate times of the year. We could take better control of the water that runs off the land. We could use wetlands to absorb nutrients, and we could take tighter control of sewage. There's a lot of leeway to get phosphates and nitrates out of sewage. What can we do personally? We can press decision makers to make the right decisions, or we can support those decision makers who are making the right decisions. What do we expect? Well, the world is warming. Unless we take better control of the nutrients getting into Lake Erie, we can expect the situation to get much worse. And that is why we've got to press and support our decision makers. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the like button and come back again to see more videos. If you'd like to know more about the environment, I have a course at Udemy called Everyone's World, What You Need to Know About Your Environment. And I'll leave a link to it in the description below the video. I'll also leave a list of photo credits and links to some very readable resources. See you next video.